Uh, so just to orient you, we're right there where the star is, and the circle is the traffic circle on Route 3A. <coughs> the cliff is really directly over from that to the east. And to get there, you take the driftway. And then most people think of the driftway as just continuing on into Situan Harbor. That's not quite true. Actually, the driftway takes a turn off to the right um, and goes to the ocean. So if you want to get out to Third Cliff, that's one way to do it. You go past the Situan Country Club on your right, well, actually the right and the left. And then when you get to the top of the hill, that you'll be looking at the ocean. Uh, the other way to get there is coming from Situate Harbor. Um, if you take a left on Gil Gilson Avenue, you can come from the Gilson Road, you can come up that way into Third Cliff, and there's a, another back way too that's not uh, quite as commonly used. So those are the two main ways. Uh, you can see it's dominated on the picture on the right. My definition of Third Cliff has expanded until it's now covering Norwell and uh, someday I might get up to Cohasset, so uh, I'm taking an expansive view on what Third Cliff is, including along the driftway there. Uh, this is another aerial view of the, of the area. Looking south from, with the harbor in the front, uh, the, the, let's see, the lighthouse should be somewhere out there on the left, the left side, and then the harbor, and then first cliff, then the second cliff. Uh, there's a, you see a beach between the two of those. Then third cliff, which I put an arrow in front of, and you see there's a beach between second and third cliff, and that's called Peggotty Beach. And then on the other side of third cliff is a smaller beach with the spit, as everybody calls it today. And then the North River, which broke through in 1898 as you heard last week if you were here for that talk by Fred and Dave Ball. And then opposite, uh, on the other side of the North River is Fourth Cliff, otherwise known as Hummer Rock. And that today is like a long, uh, long island uh, that goes down to where the bridge is that you get over to that place. So that, just to give so some orientation to where Third Cliff is. Uh, third, a cliff appears in our town seal. Uh, so it's very, it's very tied into the history of Situa because uh, it goes back to the founding of the town. Here's a better view, uh, I think, a uh, more colored version done by our town clerk. Thank you, Kathleen. And um, here's an early photo from the, probably the early 1900s of uh, the cliff, third cliff. Actually, you see two cliffs here. Those are both, I think, part of the same third cliff. It's just that there was an indentation there. So um, they're both part of uh, third cliff. Because I don't think second cliff ever got to be that high. Third cliff is pretty tall. And it's also pretty big. And probably more people live there than on the other, than, than any one of the other three cliffs. But I haven't done the research on that. Uh, but uh, it, it is a large community there today. But back then, it looked pretty kind of menacing. You know, the ocean was out there, ocean storms could come in, not a lot of houses, but I was able to make out one or two maybe little houses at the top of that cliff that juts out uh, into the ocean. Uh, so I mentioned William, uh, William Gilmore, he, he had the first windmill in Plymouth County, probably one of the earliest ones in North America. I haven't done that research either, but. This is an example of what it might have looked like. This is an old mill that's still working. It's the oldest working mill in England from 1665. Yeah, 1665. So um, it probably looks like something like that. And you might ask what it was used for. My theory is it was used for corn because that was one of the big crops at the time uh, to feed the new settlers. Now, uh, jumping ahead two centuries to 1831, um, here's a segment of a really important map from 1831 done by Robbins and Turner. And it's just uh, got terrific detail in it. So I cut out part of it that dealt with the shoreline of Situate. Uh, moving from Situate Harbor at the top down along all the cliffs 
and then down to the opening, of the, the then opening of the river, which was called the South River. So just to give you a little more detail, I put numbers here for the cliffs. Can you see those all right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I highlighted in blue the, the probable travel of ships that were then being built in the North River, which was 200 years, it was a great shipbuilding community. So they would have to come, they'd actually drag some of these vessels through the shoals there. They'd have people on both sides of the shore, and they'd have to pull them from one side to the other to avoid the shoals there. Then they'd have to go along the North River, and then take a right turn to go south along the South River, four miles, until they reached the mouth of the river that led into the ocean. Then they'd have to go back up along the ocean front, past all these rocky shores, and rocky shoals and bad weather and everything else just to get up to the safe haven of Situate Harbor. So that total trip I've estimated to be about 10 miles. Well, there was a solution for that. People started talking about it in, 19, in 1802, and that was a canal. And I've, can you see the red line? That's there. And that would cut straight through from the North River up to the Situate Harbor. And that would change the travel from 10 miles to 2 miles. So, and plus it would be sheltered from all the, the turbulence of the ocean waves and uh, the ocean rocks out there and everything else. So that would have been uh, very helpful for mariners. And the concept got, I mentioned the Erie Canal here in the timeline because that got built in 1825 and it was about 35 feet wide. Um, just to give you an idea of typical canal sizes. That would be typical to the size, the width of a road today and the width of, let's say, the driftway. And the line, and that would have been the, the size of a canal reported by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1829 report. But the proposal uh, didn't go anywhere. And it came back in 1852, and that one didn't go anywhere either. Probably there was just too much resistance from the local people. There was a lot of, a lot of people in favor, a lot of people opposed. And one thing you need to do to get funds from the federal government is to get a lot of people lined up in favor of something, and that just didn't happen. The neat thing about that 1852 report was the canal was going to be 130 feet wide. And I was just trying to imagine what would that look like in today's uh, environment. So I took a picture here um, not too long ago of uh, the road at Gil, the lowest part of Gilson Road, where you're coming in. Some of you travel this a lot, but this gives you an idea looking over towards Second Cliff. The ocean and Peggy Beach are off to the far right, and off to the left would be Situate Harbor. So that would be the logical place for the canal, and it was called dead level in the 1952, 1852 report, so it would have been very easy to dig. That's my um, <laughs> of what it would look like. <laughs> Another aerial view of that. <laughs> uh, like now, like this. And of course, we had to build bridges across Gilson Road and the driftway for cars to pass over this canal and not bump into the uh, water traffic. So, uh, let's talk about work. Because uh, the main thing here was farming from day one. Probably Native Americans uh, were farming this land before the English settlers got here in the 1630s. And then uh, mossing, which is gathering iron, Irish, Irish moss, it was also called farming under the sea because they gathered this moss from rocks that were under, <coughs> under the ocean. It was a, kind of a form of farming. And then fishing, lobster, planting, uh, I kind of lumped together. And then life saving, which is Pretty um, unique to Massachusetts, and to, uh, there's some unique things about it for Sitchell, too. So let's start with an aerial photo from 1968 that I found in the Sitchell Town Archives, where I spent a lot of time <coughs> down in the basement of Town Hall. And uh, there have been a lot of changes since then, but just to orient you a little bit, I've got this, uh, I'll talk more in detail about this. But from the left is the traffic circle. It wasn't there then. It was a really strange intersection that warned traffic of uh, poorly used traffic signals, poorly used uh, turn signals from other cars. It was a really dangerous, like a 10-point intersection. But now it's a traffic circle. 
Uh, that would be on the left, and on, on the right would be uh, Situate Harbor. So you might today you just kind of zoom through 40 or 50 miles an hour sometimes um, on a wide road that's got a lengthy curve, which my I, my estimate is it's the longest curve in one of the roads in Situate. Um, but that's not here. Uh, so let me show you. Again, my artistic impression. The driftway is the blue line. So if you get to the village from the traffic circle, you would have come down the blue line, then take a sharp left. And by, by the way, you have to take a sharp right, uh, or veer off to the right, where I circled that old farmhouse. We'll talk about that farmhouse in a minute. Take the blue line down to the yellow road, which was Kent Street, and it still is Kent Street. And then it goes, curves around, and then took a sharp right turn to get uh, to Kent Street that takes you to the village. So that's how you did it until 1969, when the new Kent Street actually, and that's the pink road. <coughs> so now you have that nice curve that goes through. If you want to go the old way, you can do that too. Uh, Situ Country Club is in the lower left. And I'm going to talk about the uh, green field there, which is still in operation. The red field up above is the top farm, which is no longer there. And because we are talking right now about farming. And I think, oh, and I want to mention that pink area that is now filled in, that used to be part of the Boston Sand and Gravel operation. So they just mined the heck out of that area. And that's why you see all those trails over there. Uh, Matt Brown is going to be here tomorrow night to talk about Building 19. Told me that that's the place to go parking. Uh, if you're here tomorrow, ask him how he knows about that. So I mentioned that farmhouse uh, that I circled in the upper left corner. That's still there. Uh, it looked like this in the early 1900s. It's at uh, 141 Driftway. I know this pretty well because I documented this for the state. It's in the state's database of old houses which is called Macros. And you can look up more detail on um, my report on that. It's pages long with many, many photos. And I want to thank uh, uh, well, Gary Banks, who was involved in that first aerial photo of Situate, was also involved in tracking down this old photo from a descendant of the owners. Uh, in, the, in the background, just notice a few things about this. In the background are fields. It's all farmland. In the far background is their cliff. And there's just a few houses up there which you can see in detail. Um, the road leading off to the right there, it's actually a little path that led up to the Welch farmhouse. Uh, so the driftway's got to be on a line that runs probably about the middle of this photo from left to right, headed right out to the ocean. And uh, if you notice in the foreground, there's three people sitting in front of the house. There's an older woman, a middle-aged woman, and a little girl. The little girl is named Grace Waterman. And uh, Nathan well, Nathaniel Turner owned this farm originally. It wound up in the hands of uh, William Waterman, who farmed this land for, for decades. Um, his daughter Grace there uh, kept this photo and wrote on the back of it that that's her mother and her grandmother sitting there. So it's a really nice piece of history. Uh, uh, also, it was fun being a detective tracking this stuff town. And it turns out that little Grace there in the photo, uh, one of her neighbors was uh, Frederick Vines, uh, and she wound up marrying him in 1927. So a neighborhood romance. <laughs> the other thing to note about Frederick Vines is his father was Daniel Vines. He was president and, or chief operator of the Boston Sand and Gravel Company at the time, and he lived in the area. <laughs> and eventually, the Boston Sand and Gravel Company wound up owning um, hundreds of acres of land in this area, including that farmhouse. But um, they sold this to Daniel Vines, apparently on his retirement. Uh, in 1947, and they lived there for quite a while. So there's quite a history for this house. Today it's pretty dilapidated, um, hasn't been taken care of for quite a while, but that house is still there. Um, this is Pitcock Farm, about 1968. You 
see, that was pretty extensive. And that's where you didn't have the drift. I don't think you had the driftway going through. You were coming up 10th Street and then taking a sharp right. And you notice right at that turn where you have to slow down to take the turn, there, there was a farm stand. So a lot of people would stop there to buy their corn or other produce, tomatoes, that kind of thing. So that was here for, for years, actually, from, I think, the Gomes family, who provided this photo to me. Uh, the Gomes family was there from 1947 until the early 1980s. Today, it's a senior uh, residence called Kent Village. Um, what else do you about this? I mentioned something. Oh, yeah. Well, the name Hitchcock sounded kind of funny to me, so I did some research. And it turns out that was the name of one of the early settlers in Sichuan. 1632, 1635. So it's possible this land was farmed from the 1600s on up to the early 1980s. Now I'll show you one other area that's still been farmed from colonial times. This is called the Old Abbey Field. Gary Banks got involved in this originally uh, in researching this and got me interested in it. I really wrote up one of these the documents for the MACRIS uh, database system documenting this field, but this, uh, this is two acres and it's still, this was last, a photo I took last summer. Uh, they're big picking beans, uh, string beans or green beans. Uh, and as far as I can tell, this has been farmed back to since colonial times. Um, here's a photo, uh, a postcard that shows the driftway with Kent Street running off to the right. The, Col the Coleman Hills are on the background. Excuse me. If you look closely, just above that red, um, I don't know, it's a Ford Model T or some other car, uh, that's the old Abbey Field. It's not surrounded then by trees like it is today, but that's the old Abbey Field. It was actually, there was an old Abbey pasture that was just up the hill from it that was even larger. Today that's overgrown woods. It's a great place to go walking through. Um, it's public land. It's owned by the uh, one of the situates uh, uh, organizations, uh, uh, town organizations. And that road that goes off the left is the road up to the situate, to the, uh, the Welch farm. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and you can see this land was still being farmed because to the right was all farmland too. It was later turned into the situate country club. Uh, there's another view looking down the hill, from, probably from the, the Welsh farmhouse. Yeah, a few points to make on this. Um, the the Situate Country Club building that we know today was built as a farmhouse probably from 1800 to 1820. It was the um, James Turner farm. He was related to, I think it was the brother of the uh, his brother, Nathaniel Turner, who owned the house that we just saw a picture of. Uh, he, he died in 1835, and his widow sold the land to Michael Welch, who, was, who had come over from Ireland and worked at, the, uh, at a hospital in Boston. Met his wife there, who happened to be in Situate. So they wound up in Situate, owning his farm. His son was E. Parker Welch, a really critical guy in Situate history. And then E. Parker uh, Welch had two sons, he had a number of kids, but uh, one son named William, but was known as Henry, uh, eventually got this farm and farmed it up until 1919 when he sold it to the Situate Country Club. And then uh, his other son, George Welch, uh, he started with his father, the Welch Company, which still exists today. It was one of the main economic engines for the revitalization of Sichuan after the boat building industry collapsed in town. So um, this is kind of like Hallow Brown. Uh, that's the Welch farmhouse on the upper right, thanks to uh, 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 a book by Duncan Bates Todd, very interesting. And if you notice on this map from 18, 18, 1879, uh, there's some things to point out here. The top of the map uh, uh, near the coast is the notation D. Ward. That's Daniel Ward. Uh, he was one of the. He was the founder of the Irish mossing industry in town. 
and we'll have a little bit more about him in a second. And then all the other names are Irish, with maybe a couple exceptions, moving down the coast. And a lot of houses owned by E.P. Welch, that's E. Parker Welch that I just mentioned, and one by, maybe by George Welch. Uh, a lot of people um, associate the Welches with the Welch Company. Here's a, an early photo from the early 1900s. Oh. The building is still there, except uh, now instead of three stories, it's two stories. Um, and at the time, it was selling, uh, was a major dealer of lumber, or coal, uh, but really just about anything else for the house. And in later years, it had a gift shop. You could buy lamps. I bought uh, carpenter supplies. You could go and have a, I had a piece of wood milled there at the mill. Uh, now there's a, at the Mill Wharf there's a restaurant that kind of pays homage to the old uh, mill that used to be there. Uh, but they, they had a big operation on Front Street, essentially. That's what most people think of as the Welch Company, uh, as, as the Welch family. But George Welch actually then became, and E. Parker Welch to some extent was one of the top three or four property owners in town. It was George Welch that really capitalized that and made that into a business of building houses and developing uh, developments and subdivisions in town. Uh, but look, going back in time again, here's a nice view of Third Cliff. Uh, it's kind of, there's a solitary house on the top, kind of lonely. Um, on the far right, this is uh, Peggotty Beach. No, no people out there beach going or swimming or anything. Although it might have been winter time, I'll give them that. And then on the far right, there's uh, the twin house of Daniel Ward. You see there's two kind of pointy roofs next to each other. That's, we, I think it's a twin, we call the twin house of uh, Daniel Ward. One side is called Bleak House. That was after a Charles Dickens novel. And the other side was called either East End, which was also involved in one of the Dickens novels, or East Side, which would be more descriptive. And it was somewhere up around Dickens Row, which is a road that's still there. Uh, and Peggotty itself is a name that comes from a Dickens novel. So this is a very uh, Dickensian area. Um, Daniel Ward's house was supposedly the first house built um, on Third Cliff. And then he moved to First Cliff and he built the first house on First Cliff. So he was quite a pioneer in addition to <coughs> establishing the uh, Irish Mawson business. His descendant, Barbara Murphy, has written a couple wonderful books about, again, an amateur historian. She's done a couple, terrific job writing a couple books. One is on the Irish immigrants, and it focuses in on Daniel Ward. But if you read her book, you get the impression that everything that happened was on First Cliff. It's not so. More Irish monsters lived on Third Cliff than any other place in town. And I've done the research, I've triple checked it, as Fred said, to make sure that that's accurate. And I've used, actually, I've used Barbara Murphy's data from her book in order to come up with this information. So uh, here's an example of the work going on. They gather the Irish moss up, usually on the boats, although Yvonne Toomey said she used to go out and gather the moss, uh, wait out there, her bare feet, and gather it from the shore and bring it onto the shore. You have to dry it out, then you have to wash it. And you can't wash it with regular water. You have to use salt water, seawater, whatever, because if you use uh, regular water, it dissolves and it goes away. So if it rains, you really have to get the stuff out of the way quick. So that's why you see these, uh, these mossing huts along the shore. Uh, this is a great early photo of uh, Second Cliff, too, by the way. You can see the houses there. And then uh, about a third of the way from the left side, there's uh, something sticking up. That's a water tower. And then there's actually another one between the right and the left side. So there's a couple of water towers up there at the time. Um, now, going back to this photo I showed before, if you zoom in on it, uh, the detail, which you can if you've got these things digitized like I have, uh, there's a man out there in a boat. He's probably either fishing or mossing or possibly lobstering. So this, you know, this was a place of work at the time. And 
it even lasted up to the 1930s. Here's a wonderful illustration from a book called Happy Harbor, which I recommend to everybody. You, go on, you have to go on eBay now to find these because they're out of print. This was built, it was written in 1938. And it was written by two authors from Third Cliff, George and Doris Howman. I talked about them in a previous talk. Uh, I've been in touch with their uh, grandson, who has been really helpful in providing information and photos about this area. But this kind of capsulizes uh, Peggy Beach from the foreground, Third Cliff in the background. Now look at all the houses on top of Third Cliff. And look at the activity that's going on, both in the, in the bay there. There's a, a man who's just come back on the right side from Moss Inc. because he's got those long-handled rigs that you use to get the moss off the rocks. <coughs> And then the foreground is uh, a big bushel basket filled with lobsters and a dog who's looking at them. I'm not sure if he's going to try to eat them or not. Uh, now this photo was shown last week when ta Fred was talking about the blizzard of 1898, the great northern storm. And this is a rare photo of third cliff viewed from fourth cliff. So we're standing at fourth cliff. Almost the entire image is taken up by the barrier beach that existed between the two cliffs. So you see the, the dark line on the right is kind of the rack line of the sea from the ocean. And the dark line on the left, that was the North River as it was taking its turn, the right turn to go south. And uh, you can see, uh, I've highlighted some of in the next image. You can see on the left, uh, there's a cart path which was about two or three ruts in it that went along the inside path because you didn't want to go on the outside path because you might run into some high tides or maybe high winds or something like that. So that was a good place for a cart path to go. And then I've mentioned in the center of the photo is some little tiny objects that I believe are gunning shacks. They also show up in some earlier um, some early paintings of this area by a watercolor artist <coughs> that uh, I've gotten enamored with. Uh, his name is uh, Thomas Buford Mediard, and he actually lived in Situate for a number of years, late 1800s, but he painted this scene with either gunning shacks or mossing shacks in the background. But this photo stands alone. I mean, uh, Fred and I were saying this has got to be the only ones we've seen on this beach. And I have a couple other things to point out. Uh, just to the right of center is a uh, light-colored building that I'm almost certain is the uh, Humane Society of Massachusetts Life Savings Commission. <coughs> we'll talk about that in a little, little more detail. Uh, but that's about where it was on the 1879 day. Uh, we actually <coughs> had two life saving stations, uh, and that was one of them. And then further to the right uh, are houses on the cliff. So, even before 1900, there were still some houses there. This is before it turned into Rivermore, the housing uh, summer colony. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so Fred and I were saying uh, this is the only photo that we've seen of this beach until yesterday. And my neighbor Sally called my attention to. Uh, called my attention to a Facebook post uh, by John Bond, uh, another photo of this. And so I called John, and he kindly uh, provided this photo, which is not in his physical possession. He actually went and got it and scanned it in high-resolution format. And here it is in all its detail. First time seen in public for probably 100 years. This is fourth, third cliff looking over fourth cliff. And you can see in the distance, fourth cliff kind of moves mm -hmm. up there. There's a tall building, a little bit set back from there. Um, we think it might be the fourth cliff house, which was a hotel then. And it would cater to hunters at the time. They'd come there for the shorebirds. They'd set up their gunning shacks and then shoot the shorebirds from those areas. That was a real popular area. And you can see the, the beach there, which is now actually probably the spit, which has moved inward uh, quite a bit. It went pretty straight over towards uh, Fort Cliff. 
Well, it's just a terrific photo. Thank you, John. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I mentioned the, Mass the Humane Society of Massachusetts. Here are the keepers of the stations, of uh, the Massachusetts ones. This, this uh, was taken in 1911. And uh, at the far left in the back, well, they, I guess they all wore bowler hats. But I don't know what happened. Uh, the far left in the back row is E. Parker Welch. Uh, nice photo of him. The front row on the far right is Christopher O'Neill, uh, one of whose descendants, I think, is still living on Fair Cliff and has been very helpful for my research. Is that right? And we'll talk about Christopher uh, in a sec, too. So they, apparently these guys got together once. Now, these weren't the only ones that were involved in the operations, but these were in charge of the stations. And then this was an all-volunteer op operation, so they would uh, have five to 10 to 15 other people from the area, in this case, Third Cliff, who would come out and help them if there was a shipwreck and somebody needed to be saved. So these guys were very important. Uh, they apparently got together every year. It was in 1912, the next year, they got rid of their bowler hats. <laughs> uh, e. Parker, I'll have a more detail on this photo in a second, but E. Parker Welch is here, Christopher O'Neill, and Osceola James. And I had to look him up. Uh, it turns out he's the son of Joshua James, who was the important, uh, probably the most important guy for the U.S. US Life Saving Service. He's featured at the uh, <coughs> museum up in Hull. And he was in charge of that station, the Point Allerton station in Hull. Uh, if you look at their website, you'll see tons of information about Joshua James. But it's, and, and the U.S. Life Saving Service was what wound up being the the U.S. Coast Guard. That was a paid position. Um, the Massachusetts Humane Society was all volunteers uh, force. But they cooperated with each other. Whenever there was a wreck, when you read about these reports in the Boston Globe of 1892, for example, it's always the U.S. Life Saving Service Station from Fourth Cliff went out to help, and the volunteers from the Humane Society went out to help as well. Uh, usually these shipwrecks uh, needed a lot of help from a lot of people. So more detail on the left is E. Parker Welch. Looks a little bit like Bob Chester, I think. <laughs> and on the, on the right, in the back, is uh, Christopher O'Neill. And it turns out E. Parker Welch, although he was one of the top three landowners in town, and had helped found the Welch Company, and owned this huge farm, uh, was also, and I was also the station keeper there until he was age 74, I think, he retired in the early 1900s. And then who took over with Christopher O'Neill? He was the station keeper until 1936 when the station was retired and then turned into a, into a private residence. And so here's where I've done a little bit more historical digging. Uh, but first, uh, people who helped, these volunteers who helped out would get rewards. Either they had a choice of either a certain amount of money or a gold medal. And this is an example of the gold medal that was handed out. I want to thank the Crowleys. Um, Elaine and Frank Crowley uh, furnished this to me and I was able to spend a lot of time shaking a nice photo of this uh, medal. And it was found in a stone wall near the corner of Driftway and Gilson Road by Frank Crowley. So, uh, I would say finders keepers. I haven't looked into the legalities of all this, but I thank, thank them for providing this to me for photographing. And the back of it is personally ascribed to, uh, I don't know if you can read that, but this is Mark McQueen, who was definitely a, a resident up on Gilson Road at Third Cliff. And this was for his help on the uh, grounding of the schooner Bull <laughs> That, that was pretty famous. That it grounded the uh, shipwreck on Nantasket Beach. That was a pretty famous shipwreck, and you can read uh, all kinds of information about that. So, you got this medal in 18, uh, 19, 1896. So the, while they were volunteers, they were recognized for their service. And they, by the way, the Humane Society of Massachusetts is still in operation today. But they've shifted their focus more towards life-saving, um, uh, and they've, they've awarded uh, 
medals recently to, or at least honored recently, people who saved people from drowning in whether it's a pool or an ocean or a lake or somewhere like that. So they're still doing good things since 1791. If I could add uh, just to that, the ceremony was held at the Maritime Museum. If you remember back yeah. uh, last January, the Harbor Master falling into the <laughs> say being saved. Well, the Humane Society came down to our museum and presented the medals there. Yeah, the medal was yeah, medal was presented for uh, life saving here at the uh, Mar uh, Maritime and Irish Museum <coughs> on the Driftway by the Humane Society. Somebody who uh, helped someone else who was drowning here in Sicily. Okay, here's a typical example of a uh, life-saving station. This would house the boats and maybe life jackets and oars and other paraphernalia. Uh, this one is uh, on the beach, or kind of the, the isthmus, I guess you'd call it, from between the first and second cliff. Um, so if you go there, you can get a closer look on that. It now serves as the home of the sailing program uh, for the town. That gives you an idea of what it looks like. Nothing fancy. The U.S. Life Saving Service, by the way, they had architects who came up with these really fancy Victorian designs, and they, many of them were two stories and had great windows and everything else. But not so for the volunteers here. Uh, here's an old photo uh, postcard uh, showing Third Cliff looking north. So what you see is the ocean on the right. You see actually Second Cliff a little bit in the second in the background. That dark thing sticking out <laughs> so far on the third floor. And then obviously the houses that got developed there in the river at the time. We'll talk about that in a minute too. Uh, the White House just to the right of center is still there. The, the 33 Collier, I think, is the address. Uh, the red building to the left, kind of about one third of the way from the left. I'm pretty sure that's a Mass Humane Society life-saving station. That's about where the other sources indicate they have been. And most of those that's been described that they were typically painted red. Uh, that, I'm pretty sure, was the Humane Society of Massachusetts Third Cliff Station. Uh, not the garage part, but the part on the right with the peak roof. Uh, the shape fits. Um, I took this photo in November 2016. Uh, the owners kindly allowed me access inside to take photos of some of the interior features. And my conclusion was it was likely that, that it was from the early 1900s, and therefore it's probably the uh, Humane Society of Massachusetts Station. And shortly after I took this photo, the building was demolished. Paul <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, and I took uh, a careful watch. Actually, I was uh, trying to sleep late like I usually do. And Paul called me up and said, you got to get out here. The wrecking crew is here and they're tearing down this house. So I got out there and I took tons of photos. And I was looking for that red exterior swag, and I didn't see it at all. And the guy, the builder who was building the new house, came over and brought me a piece of the old building, but it didn't have any red stuff on it. So my wife Kathy and I, the next morning, we took a walk over there. They cleaned up the place. It was immaculate. It looked like they vacuumed the grass or something. <laughs> and I looked down, and there are these fragments. <laughs> Red. And there's actually two colors of red there, so I'm pretty sure this, this uh, seals it, that this was the uh, Humane Society of Massachusetts station. And it was described in a great letter uh, by a woman who lived there in the 1930s when it was still active. Um, she uh, talked about the drills that they would run, the men would take their boats out and practice uh, a life-saving rescue. So uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence behind this. Any hinges? Uh, no hinges. Uh, so let's talk about play on third cliff. I have sightseeing, first of all. Uh, a lot of swimming and beach going, <coughs> gunning, which is another word for hunting. Uh, but that's the word they 
they used back in those days for hunting shorebirds. It was very popular. And actually, that went on at the same time that people were uh, beach going. I think, I, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not sure how that worked out because uh, some of the sources say that you could hear the gunshots from daybreak to, to, the, uh, to the close of night. So um, it might have been a different season. Like, I think this, a lot of the shorebirds came in the fall and there weren't so many beachgoers at the time. Here's a really early photo, 1891, that, that I found while digging through the Mass Historical Society uh, records. These are from the Adams Homan family photo collection. Uh, those were some of the early founding members of the Glades Club. And uh, evidently, they liked to uh, see picturesque sites in the area. So they took a day trip down, down to Peggotty Beach and uh, wanted to see the Irish mossers. Although well, they called it kelpers. But, you know, kelp is really a different kind of seaweed from Irish moss. Uh, close enough, you know. What's interesting about this photo is they're doing this um, as sightseeing, as kind of a picturesque thing. But you also see the work going on by the guy on the right. He's got his cart. And this is the only time I think I've seen a photo of them gathering the moss and putting it into a cart and carrying it off. Uh, usually you see wheelbarrows or other like barrows that two guys would carry to carry this stuff off. But here's a man and his horse and uh, his cart. Um, so it started off kind of as picturesque, but then more and more people started coming to the ocean. Well, at least going to the beach. They didn't necessarily go to the ocean and dress like this. Yeah, this is a teacher's eyes. Most teachers were written. This was 1899. So, great photo from the uh, Situate Historical Society collection. Uh, collections. And this is a great uh, postcard of Third Cliff. Now, look at all the houses that are up there. Consider that one solo house that was there before. And uh, you can't quite make out the uh, Daniel Ward twin house <coughs> in this photo. But certainly, you got a few people out in the ocean, more people on the beach. I don't think many people are out there. And then two guys on the right in their jackets with ties and uh, suits. So it's kind of a mix of dressing here. But um, yeah, it's a, this is a wonderful photo. And uh, in addition to people going to the beach, there were a lot of birds that went there. And I put this in just to show you the kind of target that the gunners went <laughs> uh, Paul, who's here, and I took a trek. This was Paul's idea. It was great. At really, really low tide, maybe it was astronomically low tide, we went up way out by the spit and kept going because the sandy reach goes way out there. We were probably uh, two-thirds of the way to Fourth Cliff without getting wet. Um, so we found these things sticking out of the ground. They're obviously decayed pieces of wood. And the only conclusion we can draw is these were probably gunning shacks uh, from um, long ago. Before the Portland Gale of 1898, possibly. So here's the smallest house on Third Cliff. It's so cute. Uh, it was called Cedar Camp on a very early map, back when they had names for all the houses. And the camp is really, when you call it camp, that, that's really more like a term for a shack or a, a, a hut that was used for some kind of hunting. And we, we think it, was, it may have been down further down towards the ocean, maybe where those fragments were before, and then moved up here. But it's been there for a long, long time. Uh, we think it's a possible gunning shed. So let's talk about houses, a little larger than the one we just saw. And it started with developments. You take, let's say, the Welch farm, and then you carve it up into little lots that people can buy instead of buying the whole thing. So uh, they call that subdivision, because they're subdividing a big parcel into lots. And it's also, we call it today, develop, housing developments. And then we'll look at some houses and look at a few of the people that 
uh, occupied very closely. Uh, here's a 1903 map, the great 1903 map, I should say. And um, I've highlighted those developments that are lined along the shore there in red. Mostly those are the ones that, um, that are detailed. North Situate Beach, by the way, a premier residence, a uh, premier place to live back in the late 1890s is probably one of the earliest to be developed and uh, has probably the most high style houses in, of that era in town. Uh, Rivermore's got some great houses, but um, man, they, they really had some great architects up in North Situa Beach. And uh, that started about 1890 or so. Man Hill, moving from north to south now along the coast, Man Hill was, um, uh, <coughs> recent research shows it might go back as early as 1870s. So that could be an early one, but we've got to do some more research on that. Shore Acres is there. Then Barker Farm Beach, which really exploded in 1910, as I talked about in my previous talk about the seashore, uh, situated as a summer seashore development uh, target for people. And Bar Barker Farm Beach actually was one of the ones that George Welch was uh, a partner in. I think he had a 17% share in the development of something like 800 lots. Enormous development. And that second cliff is mentioned here, and again, recent research shows this may go back to the 1870s, but um, it didn't really take off right away. It wasn't until the early 1900s that people started settling there. Third cliff's not shown as a development. I don't think it's even labeled as third cliff here. And uh, Rivermore, the same. It didn't exist in 1903. And then Hummer Rock is listed as one of the developments along the shore. Uh, third clip I want to mention there, the third one up, uh, is really a, a code word for uh, Gilson Avenue. Gilson Road, sorry. So here's a, a 1900 plan for Gilson Road. Can you see that already? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little fuzzy, but there's about 70 lots here. If you look at your deeds, many of you may find this goes back to that 1900 plan. They might cite it, uh, but if you do research, property research back, which I've done on this, a lot of these uh, houses go back to this plan. There were a few houses that were there before. Um, off this plan would be Daniel Ward's house, for example, and it doesn't cover the entire extent of Gilson Road, but most of it, probably the central four-fifths of, of uh, Gilson Road. Uh, just to mention, uh, George Welch was a part owner of this as well. He has interest in a lot of different uh, housing developments in town. But his premier one was River, Rivermore in the uh, south end of, Sitcher, of uh, Third Cliff. Uh, his plan came out in 1906. There were a couple houses there already then. <coughs> it was built on a farmland that had been in the Welsh family, uh, mostly meadows. Occupy the southern half of Third Cliff, 222 lots. Today there's about 100 houses, so most people bought a couple lots. Some people bought 17 lots in Iraq and they have a nice uh, buffer zone around their property. I'm not naming any names for that. And most roads are named after Welsh family uh, members, including Collier. You think that's a descriptive term for a coal miner, but it's not. That was a Important family in such a history, also related to George Welch and his family. And Lincoln, it's not named for President Abraham Lincoln, even though this is 40 or 50 years afterwards, this was the Lincoln family in Situate. So it was, again, part of the Welch family. And then there's Michael Avenue, which is named after George Welch's grandfather. And, um, can, I, can I ask Parker, what some of George Welch's lot sold for? Uh, they sold for a lot less than they would today. <laughs> I don't have the figures yet. I don't, I don't have the figures with me, but I, I have done an analysis of the uh, sales by George Welch because I wanted to know, did he make any money on these sales? And you know, if you assume that he got the land free from, from an inheritance and he sold these at market value, which it looks like they're pretty close to market value, he did all right. His business model, though, and I haven't really brought this out, 
It was to build the houses, rent them out for maybe seven, eight, nine years, and then sell them. So you have to factor in the rental income that he got for that time. And then when he finally sold it, that actually was gravy on top of whatever um, he earned back from the rentals. Plus he had access to the Welsh company, great store for lumber, and he probably had a good family discount for that. <laughs> All right, the Marguerite, uh, probably one of his first houses in, in the development of Rivermore. Uh, I think an iconic building built in by 1908 because it shows up on this postcard. Another version of this was postmarked 1908. This one is 1909. Uh, it stands in the middle of this postcard um, on the top of the, the bottom end of the cliff. And so this is a different part from the part that I showed you before that had the solitary single house up there. This is a little further down the coast. Uh, but it did stand at a great location overlooking the ocean, unobstructed view of the North River and the Fourth Cliff in the background there, kind of faint, but I think you can make that out. Some things to point out around here were the, the beach at the bottom of the cliff. This is before seawalls, I guess. Uh, steps that lead down from the cliff all the way down to the beach. Long walk. <coughs> going up. And then between there and the cliff edge, you could barely make out, and this is in front of the Welsh uh, Marguerite, House Marguerite, there is some rows of stone walls. Uh, this was the Griffin Farm. Interestingly, there's a family named Griffin that lives there now, but I don't think they're related. The Griffin Farm probably had cows and sheep, and the stone fences were there to probably keep them from falling over the edge. <laughs> Just my guess. Other things to point out, the, the Marguerite is iconic for a few reasons. It served as kind of a model for other houses in Rivermore. It's a colonial revival. It's got a hip roof, which means all four sides taper up towards the top. Uh, it has dormers on all four sides, looking out every which direction. And um, I think that's what I want to mention, although this type of the style of house is not the sole one in the river. Uh, here's another view of, of that also with the fourth cliff in the background. So Rivermore houses, uh, this photo was taken in 1909. Well, this photo, this postcard actually came out later, but the photo might have been taken in 1909. That was the first major street that George Welsh developed. Those houses are all there today. The house at the end of the street there is a Collier, that's 33 Collier Road, that's still there today too. And being on Michael Avenue, all the houses, and being, this is a time when houses were named, all these houses had names that began with M. So they named Myrtle, Maidstone, Mayfair, Melody, uh, Melody, yes, and Morpheus. And these have the same, you know, the hip roofs that slope towards the top on all four sides. They have wraparound porches, that was another key feature of this. Usually on the south side and the east side, so they could see the ocean and the North River at the same time. And uh, the requirement for 10 foot setback from the road, which is kind of embodied in our uh, zoning laws today. And uh, I should mention, if anyone's interested, number 10 Midstone, uh, the second one from the left is on the market today. The best preserved one of all of those on Michael Avenue. Here's Indian, Indian Nola, 36 Moreland. That's not there anymore. Um, that has not the hip roof, but a gambrel roof, which has two uh, levels as it goes up towards the top. But uh, what's great about this photo is you can see all the metal ends in the front. That's pretty much how it was at the beginning, because uh, this was an early house. Uh, it was rented from 1911, so it was probably built in 1910 to 1911, and then purchased by the Woodworth family in 1919. Uh, the Woodworth family was, uh, uh, actually the, the owner was Margaret Welsh. It was pretty typical of Rivermore for women to own the properties. And her husband was a Harvard Business uh, School professor named Arthur. He was one of the first professors of the Harvard Business School. So it was sold in 1933. 
the deed was really interesting because you usually don't put this language in about personal property because that usually, you know, if it's still there, you get, you as the buyer get to keep it all. It said, you get to keep it all except for the baby's crib, mattress and pillow, a single iron bed, two bicycles, personal articles of clothing, books, and family photographs. Um, and family photographs did survive, thankfully. Uh, we were in touch with, Kathy and I had lunch with the, the grandson of the Woodworths here. And uh, he brought the family photo album in. Man, it's full of great old photos. So uh, we've got one for you here. Here's the Woodworth kids playing on Rivermore Beach, 1912. Now, of course, they're dressed for swimming, too. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, another photo. Actually, we used this in the uh, Central Mariner art article that was on the front page last week. And this photo I showed at the Mass Historical Society and the director of publications there afterwards said, this photo makes me want to live there. <laughs> and, yeah, it shows about 10 houses at the time. But what's different from then and now is very few trees. There's a few over on the right. So you really had a panoramic view. Everybody had a panoramic view of the nature and natural surroundings. Uh, then the other thing I noticed was uh, the telephone poles. I thought, well, this photo probably was taken in the 1920s. Well, it turns out they had photo of the poems there by 1909. Actually, Gilson Road got them by 1904. Uh, and George Welch got it in his his, his house in the <coughs> town on Otis Place. He got a phone put in in 1901. He was one of four people in town. And then he had a branch line that went over to the Welch Company. So we had good infrastructure here right from the start. But it's partly because uh, the inventor of the telephone system, Alexander Graham Bell, invented it just 25 miles away in Boston. So it started from there and grew. <coughs> This, this postcard, by the way, uh, the Mariner uh, got it wrong. For, it was my fault, but uh, this is courtesy of Gail Ledwig. It's just a terrific postcard. Uh, and you know, I, I used this in a talk before, I think about a year and a half ago. And after that, after looking at this postcard for years, I realized there's a white area right in the dead center. It looks like somebody laid out a tarp or something. I think it was like crushed, uh, crushed shells. And I think it was the site of the tennis courts that they set up. Now, it was a popular sport back then. Uh, they wouldn't need it after 1919 because, as you'll see later, the Central Country Club had built its own tennis courts. So George Walsh did a great job marketing Rivermore, even putting an ad in the Omaha, Nebraska, B newspaper. <laughs> Um, he said it was a select colony. I'm not sure how select it was. I haven't found anyone who actually came out to Omaha to be. To be. Um, but a lot of the other attributes still apply. You have views of the hills and the ocean, boating and bathing and fishing and canoeing all around. Uh, we don't have a store or post office, but there's Amazon. And, uh, uh, there's lobsters in town. Uh, Great place uh, that Joe Jordan has. Uh, the trains don't run every hour, but they do go to Boston now. Uh, we've got modern houses now, some of which have been modernized cottages, and some of which have been replacing cottages. And they're fully furnished town water. And to your question uh, about what George Welch sold these for, you could rent these for the whole four months of the summer for $300 to $600. So how would you get here? Uh, if you didn't have a car, you could take a train up to Greenbush Station that started in 1871. At the right is the steamboat service that served the town for uh, two or three years, starting in 1915. The town meeting voted to authorize funds to build this pier that you see in the photo on the right because there's no other industry in town other than attracting tourists. So they came, they built, they played at the Sichuan Country Club here, which was 
the old Welch farmhouse that goes back to the early 1800s. You can see the tennis court there. This was Henry Welch's 40-acre farm, and then William Hope Waterman who owned that house with the three women in the front. Um, he sold a 20-acre <coughs> farm, not that part, but a 20-acre farm that's north of the driftway. So when you go through the driftway, it's on both sides. Another view of the country club. Wow. So a few people here, I'll just run through some of these names. Uh, William Gilson, who gave his name to the road, and whose uh, windmill was here. E. Parker Welch and George Welch and the Welch family were so important to the history of Sitchin. Captain Fred Strick Stanley was mentioned last week as being head of the U.S. Life Saving Station at Fourth Cliff. He lived on Third Cliff at 14 Bassett Lane, and the house is still there. Uh, his small photo is down below. Christopher O'Neill, who took over as uh, station master for uh, E. Parker Welch on Third Cliff of the Humane Society Station. <laughs> uh, he lived on Gilson Road, and that's a uh, candid photo of him, uh, furnished by Ray Zucker. Thank you, Ray. And uh, Joseph Flynn, who worked under Captain Fred Stanley on the Fourth Cliff Life Saving Station, also lived in Third Cliff. So when the blizzard and, and when the storm of 1898 blew a hole through the, the beach that we saw before, they had a much longer commute. They couldn't walk to work. They had to go all the way around. And then. Uh, uh, Joe Flynn, Joseph Flynn lived at 72 Gilson. Uh, I think that house is still there, I forget. But he was, uh, he also worked at the Life Saving Station. Um, yeah, I guess I just mentioned him. And then John Gill uh, started in 1921 with a cottage at the corner of Bassett Lane and Gilson Road. That house is no longer there. He was a printer for the, and head of the art department for the Boston Globe. Um, he was, uh, as head of the department, he had a, young, a group of young lads who called him Father Gill. <coughs> and they came up to celebrate his 50th birthday at his cottage in Situate. He, uh, they, among the festivities is they had, this is how they did things back then, they had uh, foot races on the beach. <laughs> and presumably awards afterwards. For that. <laughs> so they can only have that in Peggy Beach because it's just steps away from there. And then Dr. Ruth Bailey, uh, some of you may remember her, but she was an ortho orthopathic, or osteopathic doctor. Uh, she lived, and her, her mother actually bought the property at the very end of Third Cliff, at the end of the uh, driftway on the north side. Uh, she's also the one who started the Bailey building. So if you come out of, after shopping at the village market, if you come out of the building and look a little bit to your right, there's a long brick building next to the parking lot, has the Dribbles ice cream store, that's the daily building. Uh, those people were mostly on the north part of Sitchin, of Third Cliff, and the southern part of Third Cliff uh, featured Ernest Hobson, who was the first American to sell prefab portable houses. And actually, one of his houses was located on Collier Road, number 60. It's not there anymore. Of course, he built affordable houses, so it makes sense. <laughs> um, a bunch of suffragists live on Third Cliff. Meyer Bloomfield is probably the most significant historically. Lived at Three Driftway in the Marguerite, the one I showed you before. Uh, the Marguerite, by the way, uh, was demolished in the last few months, and the house is going up now. But he was a pioneer of vocational guidance and industrial relations. So you can thank him for guidance counselors in schools and for the human resources function of the businesses. Otway uh, Chockley, a great name, uh, lived in 111 Nielsen and also in the co uh, a cottage he used at Collier Road. He was president of Philip Morris. Don Whittemore, I've got his photo down there on the bottom, second from the right, was the owner of the Sitchwood Country Club from 1946 to 1982. And then Eva Morrison Abdu at 15 Collier Road, uh, towards the top of Collier Road with the great view over the ocean, which was great because she was a long distance swimmer. And even as she was older, 
she managed to save 50 lives, and many of those were off of Third Cliff. In one instance reported in the Boston Globe, she uh, saw a swimmer struggling out there. She threw off her high heels and ran down to the beach and swam out to the swimmer and saved his life. And finally, Herbert Perry. The Perry family has been a very important constituent in the history of um, history of close situate up here Cliff. Uh, he was a leader of the A.W. Perry Company, um, and a little known fact, but he owned the Welch Company after it struggled and failed in the uh, Great Depression of the 1930s. He, well, he bought it in 1932 and <coughs> up until 1982, which is way longer than even George Welch owned the company. So we can thank him for keeping that franchise going. So that's our beautiful Third Cliff. Now, just a few scenes from the area. We've got historical connections with the historical sign on Collier Road. Um, we've got great views of the ocean. We've got beaches. We've got uh, the North River and its tributaries, uh, marshes around. We've got uh, also views of the marshes. We've got a marsh, a view of the Situ Country Club looking over from the Rivermore section and looking back from the Situa Country Club back at Rivermore uh, at pretty high tide. Uh, that's the Situa Country Club today, or at least recently. And uh, the driftway, uh, and you can barely make out the connection with the old Kent Street there. Uh, this is the low part of the road that I mentioned has a culvert going underneath it. And just in the background, you can't make it out there, but that's the old Abbey Field that's still being farmed. Uh, Michael Avenue looks just like, almost like it did in that 1909 postcard that I showed you before. All those houses are still there. Um, and we have a great uh, neighborhood association called the Dirt Cliff, Cliff Rivermore. Uh, Dirt Cliff. Rivermore Improvement Association. It's a lot of letters. Um, it has a lot of events during the year, including this Labor Day tug of war. I'm not sure who won this one, but it looked like the, the women were winning. <coughs> uh, great sunsets both over the ocean and looking back the other direction. So I mean, that's, that's it. Uh,